But there is something about this place. There's something about Fort Arthur. As was already mentioned, my roots run deep here. I am the daughter and the granddaughter and the great-granddaughter of this place. As I mentioned, my family is sitting in the audience right now. And again, I want to thank you, Uncle, for uh, being a part of this movement. I also want to thank President Renard and Lamar State College for, Arthur for allowing us to do the important work of engaging communities, business leaders, and industry in a conversation about how we can shape the nation's energy system into one that really works for all people. And thank you, Secretary Granholm. Madam Secretary, your leadership and vision gives me courage every single day to do what is an incredibly difficult job. So thank you. And thank you all for being here today. I know it's the middle of a work day. <laughs> I know it's the middle of a work week. Um, and as I said, I'm the daughter and the granddaughter and the great-granddaughter of this place. But what that also means is that my story, like yours, is wrapped up in the story of our nation's energy system. Let me explain. So Port Arthur is incredibly special. I'm not just talking about the boudin, the crawfish boils, the gold shrimp, the fish fries, but it's so special because more than any other place in this country, for the past 120 plus years, you, family members, have been asked to bear the extraordinary environmental and social burdens of our nation's energy system. Port Arthur is special because you will also serve as a linchpin to our nation's clean energy future. I hope you're ready. I see some nods. At least one person, a couple people are ready. <laughs> so I'm the daughter and the granddaughter and the great granddaughter of this place. And if I am that person, I'm also the daughter and granddaughter and great granddaughter of sacrifice zones. The environmental justice literature calls sacrifice zones places people live with higher rates of cancer, higher rates of lung and heart disease, places on the fence line places like Fort Arthur. These places, which tend to be lower income, tend to be filled with first generation Americans, black people, Latinx people, They're places like Fort Arthur. The literature also tells us that communities of color, black communities in particular, are more likely to live in the shadows of fossil fuel generation. It doesn't matter your income. That's what the literature tells us. They are sacrificed. So I'm so honored to accept this award and to be invited into this special community because I know the strength of this place. I know what you have been asked to bear in service of our nation's energy system. I know that you're on the front lines in so many ways. The president mentioned the hurricane season. You're on the front lines of environmental hazards and harms, but you're also on the front lines of our climate emergency and our energy transition. So we, our delegation of over 35 people, 35 people, we are here now because of you and because of your unique place in our country's history and your unique role and important role in its future. Thank you so much, Hilton. I'd like to welcome up Joel to you. First of all, let me say to everyone, good afternoon. It's good and pleasant to see all of you here and to be here at what I consider to be a very momentous and a historic occasion. It is at once momentous because we have a cabinet member and also a member of the staff of one of the agencies of our federal government and the Department of Energy who is here with us. She is a child of Port Arthur, just as many of us are and just as I am. She has roots, and those roots that she told you run very deep. And she said something that I've always said to people wherever I go, and I'm sure you have too if you've traveled. That this is a unique place. There's no other place like it. Some of the best people I know and have ever met come from here, first the company included. 
That's a joke, y'all. <laughs> but anyway, this is a momentous occasion, but it's also an historic one. Because here we are in the middle of what is Juneteenth week. And we all know what Juneteenth is about. You know, they celebrate it all over the country, but it's uniquely Texas. And we all are uniquely Texas. No offense to Texas A&M. <laughs> but we are uniquely Texas. And we are uniquely Port Arthur. And we carry that with us wherever we go. And so what also makes this occasion momentous is because we are now faced with a decision and also, as I said earlier, climate crisis. And it's very real. All you have to do is look across the way here, go on to Pleasure Island to the south end, cross the bridge over to Louisiana, but before, before you go over, look and see. And you can look to the south, and those ships you'll see out there, that's the Gulf of Mexico, y'all. And if you turn 180 degrees and look back toward the beautiful city of Port Arthur and see its teeming refineries and smokestacks and flares, and then you travel the city streets, and you see the degradation and the poverty. And you also see the damage that has been inflicted by five major hurricanes in 17 years. And also the lack of income and the lack of faith in a buildable and usable future. So before I go any further, let me say, as you heard earlier, that I am John Beard, but I'm also the founder and CEO of the Port Arthur Community Action Network, an environmental social justice and community development organization. And I founded this organization out of love for my community, Justice Hilton, we from the same neck of the woods, so to speak, on the fence line. Having smelled the smells, seen the players, and seen all of that which has happened. But I'm also a second generation child of the petrochemical industry. And I'm second generation union also. And those roots too run very deep. So we're here at a time and a point of crisis where we see that the very industry that has created wealth and prosperity for Port Arthur also has a hand in the climate changes that we have, that we're undergoing. But there is a solution, there is a way out, there is a means of escape so we can do better. And if you know better, you should always try to do better, to improve where you are, to make conditions better where you are. And this is what we have and must do. As Ms. Baker mentioned, the numerous executive orders, the numerous bills that were passed were done to help communities like Port Arthur that have been long overburdened by petrochemical pollution, pollution that has manifested itself in high rates of cancer, heart, lung, and kidney disease. Some of you may disagree with that, but I challenge you to show me a city that doesn't have those things and has those same figures. You won't find it, not in this country or probably anywhere else. But we're not here to point fingers today. We're here to provide solutions, to find a path forward, to use this unique and historic opportunity to rebuild our city, to rebuild lives, to strengthen our community so that we can have a better and more usable future, one that is fairer and equitable for all, that we not leave anyone or any persons behind that everyone has, as we say in my church tradition, a right to the tree of life. That everybody has the opportunity to be the best they can be and to be successful and to succeed, to have a fair shot and opportunity to do that, no different no, and no less equal to that of the man or woman next to them. We all deserve that. So we're here to strive and to work to do that, not to condemn the industry. As we heard earlier, put bread on the table sent people to college, enriched the city and helped it. And now what we must do is to find ways to build on that, to have a future that is cleaner, greener, and equitable, but still provide those jobs and opportunities, that transition, as we like to talk about, so that we can continue to put food on the table, so that life can continue and opportunities can be in abundance. And that's going to require that we have a sense of restorative justice, in my faith tradition, once again, we say that if one takes something away from you or you have lost it's lost by them, they should restore that back to you twofold. So we have to have a sense of restorative justice, to restore our communities, because 
When one side of town doesn't do well, the other side can't be any better because we're all part of that same fabric of this city, this country, this state, and this world. So as we go together today and work toward doing that, hear what's being said and share and be honest and complete with each other and open, we can build that bridge that's going to make this transition possible, that is going to allow everyone to be successful and to succeed and to allow those who have been left behind and treated as less than rightful citizens the opportunity to strengthen themselves, to strengthen their communities and all where they live. Because what good does it do if we leave those behind and eventually we all fall behind? There's only one Earth, there's no planet B. We are all here on this third rock from the sun and we have an opportunity which I think is the greatest that we've ever faced to really save this planet and save humanity, save mankind. So once again, I thank you for coming here. Thank Lamar State College for hosting and having us here. Madam Secretary, a little bit of a story, you all. We met quite coincidentally. She's kind of grimacing on that. We met quite coincidentally, thanks to Ms. Baker, in Glasgow, Scotland, back in 21. And we met again at Sarah Week Conference in Houston later that year. Uh, in 22, and when she saw me and I had my name tag on, she leaned over and looked and she said, you know, you're very consistent. <laughs> and, I said, and I said, yes, indeed I am. And I'm going to be consistent and persistent until I get you here to Fort Arthur because you've got to come to my hometown and you've got to see me. And she's here. And I want to say thank you. in Charmel Shake Egypt back in November. So this trail goes a bit of a ways back, but it all ends up here in Port Arthur. And we are the center of the universe today, so let's celebrate that, but move forward and work together for a better and brighter future for all. Thank you. I'm so pleased to be here on behalf of the Department of Justice and the Biden administration to be able to be a partner with energy communities like Port Arthur. We're really interested in helping the community in whatever way the community feels is necessary to be able to create jobs, to be able to make sure that uh, pollution and air quality is good. Um, excited especially to be able to take advantage, to have the community take advantage of some of the incentives in the Invest in America agenda, incentives to help build out uh, both decarbonization technologies, technologies that remove uh, emissions from the traditional fossil industry, but also uh, technologies that capture the renewable energy like the sun and the wind. You're here on the Gulf Coast, there's lots of wind off of the, sh the Gulf Coast. There's a lot of desire to see offshore wind turbines. We've obviously got a huge amount of solar capacity. We'd love for communities to be able to benefit from that. So excited to be able to be, be here. Excited to be able to be joined by Shalanda Baker, uh, who is my uh, senior advisor on energy justice and head of our Office of Economic Impact uh, and Diversity. And so Shalanda, who set this up and is going to be leading our efforts to be uh, in Port Arthur uh, and uh, working for Port, Ar Port Arthur as head of our Tiger team on Port Arthur. Yes, so thank you so much, ma'am. And we are just so honored to be here. We're honored to be a part of Port Arthur's community today. Um, we really feel like this is a special place. I think anyone who knows about Port Arthur knows that it is essential to the history um, of the energy system here. It's in our country, it's, it's a critical linchpin to the energy system now. And we believe that Port Arthur will be a key to a just and equitable clean energy future. And so we're here because Port Arthur is special. I mean, you can look out of the window and see just how special it is in terms of the, um, the high volume and high number of petrochemical facilities, um, oil and gas facilities in this community. We know that communities have raised their families, um, deriving benefits from many of the, the power plants in, or I'm sorry, the, the refineries in this community. And so we're here to continue to talk about that energy story and energy justice to the people is really about bringing community voices um, into uh, the conversation regarding what the energy future should look like. From sort of sharing information directly with you, but hearing from you. 
So we want to talk a little bit about the energy future of Port Arthur. I mean, obviously, you all live here, you know your communities, you live and breathe in your communities. Um, but we really want to know what the energy future could look like. Beer, who's the founder and, and president of Pecan, hiding over there, Melanie. We have Stanley, the enemy, the director um, of government and community relations at Air Products. Yadira Cardenas, who is the president of Blue Lap, which is the League of United Latin American Citizens. Joe Cooper, Local 286 Training Director, United Association of Plumbers and Pipe Fitters. Justin Cooper, Business Manager, IBW Local 479. Brian Gross, International Staff Representative of United Steelworkers. My other dear colleague and friend, Bethany Jones, who's the director of our Office of Clean Energy Jobs. Wilson Kelly, who you heard from earlier, is the executive director and founder of CETA, Community and Power and Development Association, Inc. And Alejandro Moreno, another colleague of the Department of Energy, who's the acting assistant uh, secretary of um, Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy Office. Chris Powers, the Vice President, Carbon Capture, Utilization, and Storage, Chevron New Energies. And then last but not least, Melvin White, the President, Golden Triangle Empowerment Center. I'm also joined here by one of our one of your local representatives. Uh, Christian Mayer, State Representative for House District 22. And um, seated here, please do take a moment to um, introduce yourself to the audience. Oh, <laughs> and of course, ma'am, <laughs> our wonderful host for the day, uh, the president of uh, Lamar State College. Okay, and with that, we're actually going to jump right into the audience participation part. Oh, sorry, Leslie, you're. <laughs> Uh, good evening. My name is uh, Ike Mills. I'm a former executive director for Port Arthur Economic Development Corporation. Uh, so I have a vested interest in the group, the team that, that I'm with. And I'm also executive director for Texas Agriculture Small Farmers and Ranchers, uh, which covers this area, black farmers and ranchers. And one of the questions that I have, uh, I know that there's been a lot of issues dealing with industry. I know because I used to facilitate and work with them in, that, in this process for our community. And one of the big issues that hopefully we'll get down to is the employment aspect, tax evasion, some of those other issues that directly impact you know, the community as well as quality of life. One of the things that I certainly would like to have uh, assistance in is We've invited the owners of Motiva, from Saudi Aramco, to come down and just visit and look at our community because that's the largest refinery in North America. My specific question is, a lot of damage has been done to the community from local industry emissions. Can you discuss any long-term goals and decarbonization and electrification of heavy, heavy industry that's coming or should be coming into, into this process. This is something of diversification, basically is what this amounts to. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, Hilton, do you want to say like 10 seconds? And then I want to turn it to my colleague, Bethany, to kind of bring together some of the comments we've heard from unions and from industry and labor. Go ahead. Real briefly. Um, when I came back in 2000, we had 14% unemployment in the city of Port Arthur even though we lived on the fence line of the largest oil refinery in the Northern Hemisphere. We have Valero here, we have Motiva, Chevron Chemical, Oxbo Calcining, Veolia, Total, which is a French owned company, we have BASF, all these companies in this small town, but yet we had 14% unemployment. Why? 
Now, what we're hearing is that many of the people in our community weren't employed. They weren't prepared. But yet you have subcontractors pouring into the city of Port Arthur every morning, thousands of cars coming from Houston, Baytown, so many people in the restaurants, we can't hardly get in. And you're telling me that you don't have enough opportunity to hire maybe four to 500 people here in the city of Port Arthur. It's a shame. So therefore, when we build this new economy, when we build this new energy opportunity, we should not be afraid to go into those communities and we should not suspect or just suggest, well, they're all on drugs. Those young people don't want to work. Until you've knocked on every door, you cannot claim that those people are unemployable, as I've heard people state. We must do a better job at hiring our youth. We must do a better job at getting them off the streets because of lack of employment is how they ended up in the streets. So thank you so much. The America agenda can bring to Port Arthur, and how can Port Arthur apply and respond, right? You heard a lot of money being put on the table. Um, Mr. Mayor, acting Mayor, Mayor? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem, you said this is the 125th, 125th anniversary. Port Arthur has powered our nation for 125 years. And we want Port Arthur to power our nation for the next 125 years, right? We want you to lead and show how you can lead in clean energy as well. And so we want this, the notion that this Invest in America agenda, we feel this huge sense of urgency. As of today, we have 403 days remaining in the current, in the president's term, that, that's all we know that we have with this agenda. So we feel a huge sense of urgency to be able to work with you to bring a vision of employment, local employment, and of clean, clean air. So grateful that our EPA colleagues are here with us as part of our federal family. We want to be able to bring uh, life to uh, homeowners who are feeling not just bad air, but potentially bad water, um, who feel like their homes are not safe. We want to help bring safety. We also think that the economic opportunity here is enormous. You talk about offshore wind, there are going to be leases in the Gulf, you've got a port. What a huge moment. All these ports along the Atlantic coast are taking advantage of offshore wind. We talk about carbon capture and sequestration, huge opportunity here. You talk about hydrogen, clean hydrogen, huge opportunity here. You've obviously got huge solar resources, whether it's community solar or distributed solar or utility scale solar. You've got land, you have sun, you can attract manufacturing here, and you also have the federal government as a partner with irresistible incentives. So what we need is a plan. We need to work together on what is the plan, what do you want to focus on, how can we make sure that employees are brought along? And I'm so glad that in crafting this plan with you, uh, I have asked Shalonda Baker to be the head of our Department of Energy Tiger Team on Port Arthur. So she will be daughter of Port Arthur, granddaughter of Port Arthur, great granddaughter of Port Arthur. And she will be back with our Army and Force and I would love for our Army, our Port Arthur Brigade of the Federal Family to stand up. If you came with us, come on, come on, stand up. These are your allies in the federal government in making this happen. So I want to say, Mr. Beard, thank you so much for this invitation and for your persistence in insisting that we see Port Arthur, because the president, I'm, I'm here on behalf of President Biden, and I have taken the stories that I've heard and put them in my backpack, and we're bringing this back to Washington. And the president's goal 
is to make sure that communities that have fence line communities, communities that have been unseen, that they participate in the economic opportunity that this Invest in America agenda presents to us. So thank you for your invitation. Thank you for hosting. Thank you for the words and the partnerships that are represented up here and in the community. Industry, community members, uh, NGOs, all of you. We've all got a role to play. Don't just sit back and wait for us. Work with us. We've all got a role to play. So thank you all so much for this invitation. We are a beautiful community. Thank you.